Well, Patrick, thanks for joining us and welcome to Business Spectator. Oh, it's my pleasure. Now, um, uh, last week's GDP numbers from China, 7.7% for the uh, first quarter, shocked the markets and led to a bit of a crunch in commodities in particular. Firstly, were you surprised at those numbers and do you think the market actually reacted correctly to it? Well, I was a little bit surprised in the sense that we saw a lot of cash flow into the Chinese economy, a lot of new credit. Uh, and uh, I expected that while that wouldn't really be sustainable, it wouldn't necessarily turn around the, the, the story of the Chinese economy, that they'd see a little bit more bump than they did. And, and I think that that's, you know, seeing a slowdown in the Chinese economy is not necessarily a bad thing if it's happening for the right reasons, but it's not happening for the right reasons. It's, it's in the face of an onslaught of credit that's trying to prop up investment and it's not really succeeding. So what are the consequences of that? I mean, you've got credit and GDP going in different directions now, which is unusual. Which of them is going to uh, break first. I think what it indicates is that there are declining returns to credit expansion in China. That China has uh, has really been riding a credit fueled investment boom for the past several years. But that as those investments don't generate returns, more and more of the resources in the Chinese economy are being locked up in rolling over bad debt, and particularly rolling it over it at bad debt at interest, which eats up even more of the credit expansion. So what we're seeing is that the, the, the old recipe for boosting GDP growth is no longer succeeding. So do you, does that mean that you think the GDP growth has further to fall? That's right. I mean, look, if you, uh, if you, you know, over the past several years, about half of GDP growth has come from investment, sometimes more. Um, and that means that every year, China not only has to match all the roads, bridges, highways, condos, villas, ports, airports, uh, high-speed rail lines that it built the last year, but it has to actually exceed it. Uh, and it has to finance that. Uh, and, and if it's not getting returns from its previous investments, it has to finance it through credit expansion. And so, you know, really, uh, the, the, the problem here is that... So China's a Ponzi scheme. Well, you know, it's funny because, uh, well, half the new credit is coming from these investment vehicles, uh, trust products, uh, and, and private wealth management vehicles, which I'm not calling the Ponzi schemes. The previous, um, uh, the head of Bank of China, who's now the top securities regulator, compared them in China Daily, uh, a, a government publication, to Ponzi schemes. So it is worrying. Patrick, we've had a most wonderful time selling minerals to um, China for the last four years. Um, can that continue? Uh, not at the same pace. Uh, so it was a windfall, and, and Australia rode that windfall, but it's not the new normal going forward. But how far will it go down? What, what are you talking, 10%, 20%, 30%? You know, it, it, it's, it's really hard to say. Uh, it depends a lot on, it, it, I think China's behind the curveball already in terms of this economic adjustment away from the relying on investment to a greater balance between consumption and investment. China's investment story doesn't have to end, but it does have to strike a, a, a better balance with the rest of the economy. Uh, a soft landing, which a lot of people hope for, uh, I think would mean that investment would just flatten out and that it wouldn't necessarily be contributing to GDP growth. And so we wouldn't necessarily see that much growth. But a hard landing could mean that we actually see, you know, when we see booms and busts around the world, especially in investment or real estate, we don't see investment level off. Usually it falls off. And, and that could really have a serious impact. So what if it, it, on the optimistic scenario, um, the consumption of minerals would roughly stay steady. That's right. That's right. And any growth in the GDP will come via services and consumption. That's right. Although I don't think that we're necessarily talking about the same levels of GDP growth. Uh, that uh, and that you know the good part of that story is that that the China consumption story uh, benefits a lot of other sectors other than raw materials. But uh, but for for the raw material sector that has been really. Uh, relying on a surge in, in Chinese demand, um, you know, that was, that was a product of a, uh, of a very uh, unique uh, strategy uh, to try to boost credit uh, and ultimately a not, not a sustainable one. Patrick, the, the, the former Premier of China in his final speech described the Chinese growth model as unsustainable. You clearly, from your comments, agree with that. Can you see a path, a transition path to a new model and what would that new model look like? Well, I think any path really involves a correction in, 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 uh, in the property market, in, uh, um, in the allocation of credit, uh, recognition of losses that have taken place in the banking system and are now being rolled over to try to clear that out of the system so that productive lending can take place. Uh, the problem is that the Chinese want a correction without having a correction. 
And so while a lot of the leadership, uh, both the old leadership and the new leadership, has been talking the right game in terms of, a, of, of an economic adjustment, uh, very little has come out of that, uh, that, that a lot of the policies that they're talking about uh, for, for rebalancing the economy are still on paper. And, uh, and the, the actual policy has been to try to boost credit, uh, including shadow banking, to try to keep investment up. Uh, and, and unfortunately, if you try to squeeze that, uh, that investment growth for all it's worth, uh, I think you do end up in a hard landing scenario. There's something like, I think it's four trillion US dollars in that shadow banking system or 40 something percent of GDP. Nobody really knows. <laughs> no, one, no, no one really knows. Yeah. Um, can you have the kind of correction that you're referring to? Which, um, which is anything other than violent? Uh, look, I think that uh, uh, even a soft landing means a very serious adjustment in terms of who the winners and losers are in the current Chinese economy, and and for people and uh, for people outside of China who have been piggybacking on their growth. But this when, might take a long time to happen. Like, I, I, I think it's happening. I think it's already happening. It happened. It was this growth squeeze took place last year. Uh, there was a serious, uh, the beginnings of a serious meltdown in the property sector beginning at really the summer of 2011. Uh, it was rescued by a new injection of credit. It's all really credit driven. The property market has been credit driven and uh, they instead, you know, rather than having a soft landing last year, what, what actually took place was they were coming in for a landing uh, and, and it looked like it was going to be a hard one and they waved off and they injected a lot more credit in to try to, but they didn't get much of a bump out of it. They just got a modest bump. But Ronnie Chan says, look, we've got a huge program of urbanization ahead of us in China. Right. Uh, therefore, mineral demand will hold up. Yeah. I think that a lot of people, including Chinese officials, are thinking about urbanization wrong. Uh, urbanization throughout the world has not always led to economic growth. Very frequently in developing countries, people have moved to the cities and ended up in squalor. So the key to successful urbanization is that taking people from a rural environment and putting them in an urban environment has to lead to productivity gains, real productivity gains. And those productivity gains then pay for all of that supporting infrastructure that makes urban life livable. Uh, so a lot of these things, subways, water treatment plants, all these investment projects, they're actually costs. And they have to be supported through uh, real productivity gains, which means, that, which means economic reform in China. The problem is that most Chinese officials, when they talk about urbanization, they say, well, people are moving to the cities, and that's good because we get to build stuff. And building stuff adds to GDP. But who, what pays for that stuff that's being built? Um, right now, the, what's paying for it is they're issuing high-yield bonds, promising 10 to 12% returns. Now, and they're selling them to, pri to private wealth management vehicles and investment product. Uh, investment but are they, are they getting 12, 10 to 12 percent income? No, they're not. To, to service those bonds? That, 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 that's why the new securities regulator, uh, Xiao Gang, called them Ponzi schemes, because they're paying out based uh, on new inflows. Who's issuing these bonds? Uh, banks are the main conduit, okay. but banks are not always the issuers. So, so there's trust uh, uh, trust companies. Uh, essentially, they're just investment products, and they're being sold to companies, and they're being sold to retail investors, uh, and often on very short-term basis. So they promise uh, they roll over every 45 days or 90 days. So you've got a liquidity mismatch between people who think that they've got essentially bloody hell a mere cash investment that's locked up in very long-term projects. And many of those long-term projects may never actually pay off. So we should run for our lives. But, 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 but how, much of this, how many bonds have been issued? How many bonds have been issued? What, 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 what right now, it's that? about half of the new credits that's being issued in China. And in the first quarter of this year, that was one trillion US dollars. So about uh, half of that. So half a trillion US dollars okay. in, new sh in new shadow credit was issued. What you're talking about, Patrick, is mis misallocation of capital on a grand scale. The Chinese have surprisingly moved quite quickly to liberalise the currency, um, but they haven't done much at the back end deregulating their own um, financial system. Is that a necessary um, next step for China if it wants to actually get its finances in order? It's an important step down the road uh, for China to be able to have the uh, new discover new competitive advantages. You know, China relied on on cheap labour 
and it relied on a low, lot of low-hanging fruit for bringing people from the rural areas and putting them in a factory. You got lots of productivity gains. So increasingly, China is going to have uh, to rely on to find new sources of competitive advantage, and one of them has to be more efficient allocation of capital. So it's very important to China's future. However, one of the reasons why I think you see uh, a reluctance to actually open up the banking system is because a lot of bad debt is being brushed under the rug and hidden there. And you know, we, we saw this with Japan in the 1990s. In the early 90s, Japanese banks just sat on a lot of bad debt. You didn't have a financial crisis, they just sat on bad debt, you had zombie banks. When they tried to reform the banking system, a lot of this came out of the woodwork and they had to recap the banks. And so it's a question of when you recognize the losses that have already taken place in the Chinese economy. But fundamentally, the, the Chinese economy has, uh, is being rebalanced. The, the, the leadership understands it, and what they're doing is they're reforming the labour market to ensure incomes rise, and they're seeing that the currency rises, and that is leading to an increase in consumption. In the last figures, consumption actually did exceed investment, I think, for the first time in a long time. Consumption exceeded investment uh, as a contribution to GDP growth, but both consumption and investment fell in terms of their contribution to GDP. So instead of rebalancing, what, I mean, one way of rebalancing would be for investment simply to collapse, and then you'd be left with the consumption that you've got, and that's rebalancing. But I don't think that that's what, what most people that's think of. That's not what everyone has in mind. Right, what most people think of is that consumption is going to rise dramatically. And in fact, what we've seen is consumption actually, uh, it's it's growing, but, it's, but the contribution to GDP growth has actually been declining over the past. So is that because in order to achieve consumption, to rise, get consumption to rise, they need to reform their social welfare system so that people don't have to save as much. That's part of the equation, but it also really it means putting more resources in the hands of households. You know, China's export-led growth model is based on suppressing domestic consumption, max channeling as many resources as possible to investment. Now, that would normally lead to a highly imbalanced economy, but they make up the difference by selling abroad. The problem is that that external demand isn't there anymore, it isn't there in terms of providing growth. And so they need to have consumption drive it. But but that means channeling resources back to the household sector. That means changing tax policy, which uh, channels resources away from the household sector. It means changing exchange rate policy, because a, a cheap renminbi means lower buying power for Chinese consumers and in exchange for a competitive advantage for Chinese producers. And it also means changing the way the banking system works. Because low interest rates, artificially low interest rates, especially in an environment where people have to self-insure, uh, means that people have to save more in order to hit their savings targets, while in exchange for companies getting cheap credit. And so, you know, normally people think, oh, well, if you want to boost your economy, uh, cut interest rates. Well, cutting interest rates in China just boosts investment and actually hurts consumption. Last year, um, the authorities actually widened the band of rates that banks were allowed to offer. Has that had any impact? You know, I think that there are people in the PBOC, China's central bank, who really do want to move towards a more liberalized, not just exchange rate, but also uh, flows of money in and out of China. And I think they're right in the long run. This is something that will be, is very important for China's future. Um, but, you know, it's, what we see is a lot of preparation, right? It's kind of like people, you go swimming, you know, you get your towel, you get your uh, slippers, you get your, you get your uh, uh, flotation device, you get ready. Do you jump in the pool? And jumping in the pool means that you open up the capital account and you allow free flows of capital in and out of China. And for all the reasons we've been talking about, I think that there are a lot of obstacles to that actually taking place. Um, do you think that relations between the US and China will be stable? Or do you think that the US and China will have great difficulty because China is encroaching into the US area? Uh, the relationship between the US and China is very broad and it's very rich and there are areas of cooperation and there are areas of profound disagreement. And I think that that, that will continue to be negotiated in the years ahead. Uh, there is a growing uh, interdependence between the United States and China. I think it will grow even deeper as Chinese companies invest in the United States. Uh, I think that there's a win-win that comes from that. Uh, but obviously, you know, you're talking about two very different political systems. Uh, you're talking about uh, a China that is uh, feeling uh, its influence in the region and trying to discover for itself what, what it really wants uh, in terms of uh, its role in Asia and its role in the world. 
And uh, that's going to lead to some tensions. We've already seen, obviously, tensions in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. Hopefully those won't overshadow the benefits that come from the relationship. Now, um, Patrick, you've moved from Beijing to New York and you're now the strategist for a global investor investing relatively conservative money. I take it from what you're saying that you're out of China investment-wise. No, not necessarily. You know, I think that uh, the old China story is over. And the old China story was just hop on any bus because all the buses are going to the same destination. Um, and that's what that's what drove the China IPO market was was uh, you need to this is the first company that's in this sector that's IPO and you need to be in this sector in China because it's going to grow and it doesn't really matter corporate governance whether the company you know, the accounts are really accurate uh, what the management quality is doesn't really matter because we're going to see huge growth. I think going forward uh, the, the new environment is going to place a premium on uh, being selective. You know, which companies really have resilient business models? Which companies have good management teams? Uh, which companies have robust capital structures so that they're not overextended and, and they can survive the, the vicissitudes of a normal economy? And, and, and well, would it be fair to say that you're underweight as a, as a China class of investment? You'd be you would be underweight. I think you need to take a skeptical eye towards any China investment, in the sense that will it or China related investment because there are a lot of companies that are you know uh, predicating the growth on China and and ask can this story withstand uh, the changes that the Chinese economy is going to go through? And does it also China mean d does that also lead you to be underweight Australia? You know, some people look. Uh, you know, we're not in a position of, of shorting China or shorting Australia. I mean, some people do use Australia, particularly the resource uh, uh, sector here, as a proxy for China, and even a banking sector because of the exposure to the resource sector. Um, you know, again, I would say that that look. In any correction, there are winners and losers, and even in sectors that are bearing the brunt of that correction, um, there are companies, there are managers who are prepared. They've seen this coming, and they've they, and they actually can can benefit from uh, from the fact that their competition uh, is winnowed out, and uh, and they may even be able to pick up assets cheaply. So so even in, for instance, the real estate sector in China, which I think is going to see a real correction, there are companies that I like. There are companies that I think are uh, have been very wise in their strategies. There are companies that have cash uh, on hand to be able to pick up uh, distressed assets cheaply, and it's going to benefit them. I know this conversation about China, and I suppose there's a dimension, Chinese dimension to this question. There's been a lot of discussion in the States about the sort of reshoring of manufacturing activity that, that was exported to China a decade or two ago. Is, is that happening? Is it real? And how profound a change is occurring in the US economy? Some of it is happening um, because of, of rising real costs in China. Um, some of that reshoring is actually taking place, to, to, is, is moving to other places, not the United States. You know, it's going to, uh, uh, it's going to Bangladesh or it's going to Cambodia or Vietnam. Uh, some of it is coming back to the United States, some of the higher value part. And, and part of it is due to lower energy costs in the United States. I mean, that is a big story in the U.S. and it's affecting uh, Europe. It's affect it will affect Australia in terms of exports of LNG. Uh, so, so that's that's certainly going to reshape things. You know, I have a friend who is in the chemical industry in China, uh, for a you know, head of a global uh, company doing a lot of investment in China, and he said that for the past 20 years, it was a no-brainer that if you were going to build a petrochemical plant, you would build it in China, uh, or or at least in Asia, and now you would probably build it in the United States. So that's a big change. We'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Patrick. My pleasure. Good to be in Australia. Yeah.